Thank you so much for Product Crunch for having us here tonight. I'm um, really pleased to see so many people show up. Um, tonight I want to basically do three things or make sure that you walk out of here with um, three new um, pieces of information. One is I want to introduce Lowfeld and myself and kind of tell you a little bit about our company vision, about the technology behind Lowfeld. Secondly, I want to actually talk a bit about the key challenges of using haptics in your user experience design because I think that's, that's a pretty big topic right now. And the last part, the third part is, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the challenges of building a technology company. So let me start maybe with myself, because once you know a little bit about my background, you understand better where, you know, why Lowfield is there and, and where we're headed. So my background is actually neither business nor tech. My background is actually music performance. I'm originally a classically trained bass player. Um, I have three degrees in music performance, um, composition, audio technology. So it's quite an, quite an off-topic uh, study that I did. However, I grew up at a time when the Atari basically uh, became a music instrument. So in the 90s, some of you might remember, the Atari ST became really like a, a key part of, of um, new music performance and electronic music. And that's basically the part um, that, that you know, pulled me into the technology um, industry. I started doing a lot of hacking on the Atari and, and used to the, the old C-Lab Notata, if anyone remembers what that software was. I think most of you are probably too young for that, actually. Um, in the 90s, I worked for a company in uh, Hamburg called eMagic. Uh, they got acquired by Apple in 2001. This is now um, probably better known as GarageBand and Logic. So that's a, a software we actually developed in Hamburg. And there's, uh, I think the development team is actually still there. And then I spent some time in New York and came back to Berlin and started working for a company called Ableton. Some of you might actually um, know Ableton. It's a music um, technology company. And I worked there for about seven years. Started off as um, a sound designer slash product support and then ended up being a, a product owner or product manager, managing basically two core pieces of the software, which was the devices, so everything that synthesis, affects um, DSP, and the second part was a tool called max for life It's a, a visual programming environment that allows you to build your own tools. Now, when you deal with digital instruments, um, especially when you come from an analog or an acoustic background, you quickly realize there's one important piece of information missing. Basically, if you plug a plastic key on a keyboard, there's nothing coming back. If you have an upright bass or a violin, if you plug a string, you have a very um, detailed tactile experience. You can actually feel the instrument. And when you're a classically trained performer in an orchestra, you wouldn't actually be able to perform if you wouldn't feel the instrument because you can't hear what's going on. You're, let's say you're a violinist and there are trombones behind you and you, you really can't hear what's going on. The tactile sensation is actually the big part of the experience that lets you really shine and control your instrument. Somehow, when we switched to the digital instruments, that information just got completely lost. I think partly because the tech wasn't there, but it just didn't really seem important at the time. And that basically led to a development in the music tech industry that um, put a lot of information into, into visuals. So, you know, when, when you see a DJ or an electronic artist perform on stage, they have a laptop and they're actually glued to the laptop the entire night. They actually have to look at blinking lights and values and, and knobs. And it's not really a very pleasant way to perform uh, with an instrument. So to just give you a little bit of an impression of um, you know, what that means, that connection between sound and um, haptics, I actually picked out this video um, that you can find online, uh, which shows you a little bit of the, again, the connection of vibration and sound. Oh, sorry. <laughs>
So really what you're seeing here is the direct translation from sound into vibration and it's visualized through these different patterns of sand um, on, on plates or, or water waves. And so this has been really driving me from the beginning to think about like how can we recreate this digitally because the problem that I've seen so far is that we're really stuck in 1994. The haptic technology that you feel today in your mobile phone, in your PS4 controller, is basically the same tech that was already used in 1994 in a Motorola pager. It's a so-called ERM that you can turn on or off. It basically gives you once one vibration by spinning um, an eccentric weight and there's no, uh, there's no depth or experience behind it. The tech was originally designed to warn you, to, to give you a notification, for which it's perfect. You know, it, it just buzzes in your pocket and then you know there's a phone call that you have to take. But now we're living in an age where digital devices try to communicate a lot more. You know, they're trying to give you immersive experiences, gaming experiences, textile, like textures on a phone. And that old technology basically doesn't live up to that standard. For us, we're looking at this as um, you know, a change into high-definition haptics where we want to recreate really, really rich textures that you know, give, you, give you clicks, textures in the game. They, they give you explosions and gunshots or footsteps. You can feel the different surfaces when you, let's say you have a first-person character walking on gravel or wood, you will actually feel the difference of, of those textures in your game controller. And that is basically our, our goal for, for our high-definition haptic technology. So again, to recap, there was no tech on the market. We saw there is this need for a better haptic technology, but we also didn't just want to come out with a piece of technology. We just didn't want to come out with like an actuator that vibrates. There needed to be a little bit more UX and, and, and the ability to actually test it with real people rather than, uh, again, just a PCB or, or an, an actuator. So we actually decided to launch a Kickstarter project with a concept product that we developed, and it's called the Baselet. The baselet is a wearable subwoofer. It's something that you can connect to your headphone, or there's a sender device that connects to your headphone, and it transmits the music wirelessly to your wearable, the baselet. And the baselet gives you a tactile sensation of bass, almost as if you're standing in front of a subwoofer. So it, it really you know, gives you parts of the music that otherwise you wouldn't be able to experience because headphones can actually recreate these really low experiences. The Baselet became really quickly one of the uh, top five most funded projects in Germany. Um, so we raised, uh, I think, 600,000 in a month. And more importantly, we actually put Baselet into mass production within six months. So we, we launched it in June 2016, and we didn't even have a manufacturer at the time. And we had pretty high goals in terms of quantities. So then within six months, we actually went to Asia, you know, met all the contract manufacturers, set it up, went through the whole DFM process. And on the 23rd of December 2016, we shipped it into 67 countries uh, with certification and everything that you had to do. The product is completely designed from the ground up. So um, inside you see this thing here, which is our own uh, micro actuator. It's a, a piece of technology that, that is able to recreate wideband um, haptic vibrations really, really efficiently and at really low frequencies, which is important. Then the other part of the device is the battery, um, which is like in most devices these days, battery lifetime is one of the most critical parts. And then the PCB is actually kind of, it's like a rigid flex PCB that's kind of wrapped around that whole thing. And it's, it's basically very thin. We have a, um, some devices here. So after the presentation, when there's a break, you can actually come around and try them out. So the interesting thing, uh, you know, after going through this whole process of Kickstarter, doing the DFM, shipping it out to, I don't know, we had, I think, 5,000 Kickstarter backers, and then we started also online sales through Amazon on our own website, we actually started to get a lot of feedback from people, um, really interesting, super diverse feedback, um, and, you know, it ranged from just music lovers that are basically saying, wow, you know, this is completely changing my music experience. I could actually feel things that I've never heard in my music before. They're like re-listening the entire music library again. Then we also had a lot of um, people from, you know, for example, the hearing impaired community um, reach out and try it. We had a, a feature on BBC that actually filmed a deaf couple that um, did their wedding dance with two baselets because they, that way they could actually experience the music. So there, there were a lot of really, really great moments when, when we launched that product and they made us really proud of it. And we, we basically gathered a lot of feedback on, um, you know, the usability, the, the user experience, the, what are people liking about it, what do they not like. We could also test our tech um, 
for let's say lifetime and fatigue so to make sure that you know now i think they have it for for almost two years no, actually more than two years no almost two years and there's no you know there's no breakage on our motor for example there are some of the key parts that we invented uh, we were quite scared that they wouldn't actually last but um, the basis was a great validation so here's a, sh a quick excerpt that um, we did right after the kickstarter campaign where we basically demoed the baselet for the first time to people this is not staged this is actual people just coming in getting the baselet demo and and telling us what they think <laughs> wow. It was like, wait, what? Ah, that's pretty rad. Oh, that's that, man. Enjoyed that, man. That's it. It's like amazing experience. I was wondering like how I would have feel it from my wrist, like all the way, but actually I was able to somehow almost feel it in my chest, like the same feeling I would get in a club. You've got like the sound here, but then you've got the feeling, like the, the physical presence sort of goes straight to your stomach. It's, it's mad. It's mad. And it wasn't like just listening to really good headphones, you know, it was like a different kind of... It definitely felt like more was going on body-wise than just the sound of the music. That's actually the feeling that I would want to feel when I'm listening to music. It's like I want to feel that bit of bass. No, I, I don't necessarily think of myself as a big sound person. It gets you totally pumped. Yeah, it feels like you're like you're just really in a in a club. I can see how like some songs wouldn't be the same without it. I don't think I've felt something like it before. I didn't expect this this motion and this this feeling. I'm, I'm glad to have actually tried this thing. It's like it's pretty dope. Can I uh, can I listen to one more song on it? So the interesting thing here that you heard several times in the feedback from people is that they talk about the physical experience. Some people feel it in a different part of the body as where we actually apply the vibration. And so it seems like for the first time from a UX perspective, you can actually design for a physical experience, which is amazing. You know, it's not just on off vibration. You can actually recreate something that touches people and that puts them in a certain emotional state. So for us, that was kind of like the, the opening gate into, into the industry, into the market. I mean, the long-term goal for us, obviously, is not just launching Baselit. It is about placing our technology in the market and, and changing the way we experience products today. We're really frustrated with the buzzing, like the dull buzzing vibration in, in smartphones or, or game controllers. And we have now the ability to change that into something much more rich. So the next step, after directly after launching Baselit, we basically went into into different markets and looked at like you know where is the biggest gap, where is the biggest need, uh, which market is kind of moving fastest in in you know being willing to adapt something like that, and actually the gaming market was the one that um, that really gave us the fastest traction. Uh, in gaming, haptics is a really essential part of the experience. Again, like you feel, you see a character on screen, you hear it, but still the the haptics that you get in a PS4 controller is still very very rudimentary. Um, so we started hacking products. We basically, and again, we have some actually some prototypes uh, here that I'm going to show later. Um, and now, after about um, almost one and a half years, we're really close to launching the first product. So unfortunately, I can't show it tonight because we're still one week short. But in about one week from today, if you go to loafer.com, you will actually see the first major gaming product that will have loafer tech built in, and it's coming from one from a major Asian um, gaming brand. So we're really excited about that. This will be the first mass um, application of our technology, and um, the main, I would say. For that product, the two main um, benefits we saw from our technology um, compared to the traditional haptics is that on one hand is, or actually from no haptics, is um, if you add haptics to a experience, you can actually increase your reaction time. And there's even scientific papers around it. In a nutshell, you know, we did tests of someone wearing headphones and, um, and hearing a warning or a gunshot or something like that, and then you react to that in a certain time frame. We play that same sequence back and we add a haptic signal to it. So you basically feel, feel it, not only hear it. And the reaction time actually increases by 60 to 80 milliseconds, which is huge for gaming. So if you get a 70 milliseconds, let's say if you get a 70 milliseconds um, advantage over your opponent, then that is a pretty big deal. And on top of that, you can also use um, haptics um, stereo. So you can actually use it to, to improve your localization skills um, in a game. So let's say you can actually feel when an opponent is approaching from one side. And so I think this, you know, in, in a few months or maybe in a, in a few years, um, we really believe that this will actually be the de facto standard in, in gaming. Gaming. And the other part um, is immersion. I mean, again, f you know, games are really high res. It's almost like watching a, a Hollywood movie or, you know, being really in reality. Um, haptics, 
if they are just really buzzing, it kind of pulls you back out of that again, you know, because it's an unnatural experience. If you have supernatural high-end haptics, they can really deliver that experience of touching an object, feeling a texture, feeling a gunshot. And so it's really an essential part if you want to have an immersive experience. A quick rundown, I'm not going to spend too much time on our technology, there's a lot of stuff we can't talk about anyway, but just to give you a quick overview, um, from a low-fit perspective, the, the important thing is we're actually not just a hardware company, it's software and hardware. One of the key things we notice is you can't just build one piece of hardware that solves all these problems, because it's not only the vibrating actuator that delivers the vibration, it's also the way you drive it, the way you create the signal, the way also thinking about how do you actually get the signal, because in, a, let's say, in a classic PlayStation 4 game title, there is no wideband haptic definition. It's actually similar to the whole plot problem. There is no content that can actually drive this high definition technology. And so what we did is we developed three, um, or we have basically three parts uh, that, we, that we give to our customers. One is our actuator. I'm going to show that uh, in more detail in a second which is a wideband actuator. Um, it has a super short rise and fall time, so when you, let's say, you, you put a click into it, it's, it, it can deliver like a really sharp like um, click effect. Um, it is silent, which is really important, so you can drive it um, at a really high intensity without buzzing or creating weird noises. And yeah, and it's also obviously a patented design. On the software side, um, it's actually one of the really important parts. As I said, there is no content out there right now that can actually deliver wideband haptic um, information. So games have only on-off information for vibration. In the beginning, when we, when we looked at this, this was really a showstopper. We couldn't really you know, put our tech into a PlayStation and demo it. So we looked deeper into it and then found out actually all the information we need is in the audio. The audio has so much information about what's going on in the game um, and, and what you actually want to feel as a game. Let's say gunshots, footsteps, everything is there. The only thing you have to do is actually separated. You have to find the bits and pieces that the gamer wants to feel and you have to filter out the stuff that you don't want to feel because if there's like voices or, or background noise you don't want to constantly vibrate the, the game controller or, or headset or whatever you're wearing. So we developed a, a, um, a high-end algorithm that basically takes the audio in real time, source separates it, and basically cuts out the little bits and pieces um, that you as a gamer want, want to feel. And we're right now the only um, company on the market that can do this in real time with less than six milliseconds end-to-end um, -end latency. And the last part is user experience. So again, this is something that I'm going to touch on a little bit later. Um, if you work with product companies, like even the top brands in the world, there's very little knowledge about haptics. I think Apple is probably the only company that has built, uh, for several years now, built a pretty strong haptics team. The rest of the industry is just starting to adapt it. So with our experience, we can help customers to, you know, to really design, uh, not just slot in like a piece of hardware into their product, but really think about how does that feel, how do you need to drive it, where do you place it in your product. And so we also gathered a lot of experience in our team um, to, do, to do that. Here's a quick demo of our actuator, just driven with a moderat song, basically. So you can see, like, with the different baseline, with the different frequencies, there are different um, speeds that we can play back. So basically, the main difference between this and a classic actuator is a classic actuator can just spin at one speed. We can deliver different frequencies, different amplitudes. It's more like a speaker. It's basically a speaker that um, doesn't move sound. It just moves mass directly into your skin. Regarding software, so I mentioned we have this real-time algorithm that, that source separates audio basically, so we can, we can separate the things that you want to feel from the things you don't want to feel. Um, it's quite hard to visualize actually, so I came up with this quick demo where it's just a spectrogram of two audio signals. On the top you can see the original um, signal that is coming into our algorithm, and then on the bottom you'll see um, the one that is coming out and driving our actuator, and on the right side you'll see the gameplay. This is an excerpt from Battlefield, a pretty, pretty popular first-person shooter. There should be some. So you can basically see there are a lot of voices, there's background noise, there's sirens, all that stuff going on. But in our DSP it's all gonna be filtered out. All you feel are the shots, the, the, the things that you really want to feel as a gamer. Another demo, which is a little bit less brutal, is uh, from a game called Limbo. Um, I really, that's probably one of my favorite games um, on the market right now. It's a little boy. Um, you don't really know why he's there, what he's doing, but um, he's basically going through this maze of um, adventures. And again, its top is the incoming signal. The bottom one is um, uh, the signal that, that we extract from, from the audio.
And if you listen really carefully, you can hear that here you, s you hear the footsteps of gravel. And here you hear footsteps of the, the, the wood, basically. Um, and that information is enough to give people um, a different haptic experience, like one soft one that feels like you're actually walking on gravel and a, a really hard one that feels like you're walking on wood. And again, we actually have that as a demo here, um, hacked into a Nintendo Switch, so you're more than welcome to uh, try it out afterwards because um, feeling is believing. The last bit um, I would mention here is um, regarding haptics is it's actually incredibly hard to get better haptics into your product. So I talked to a, a product designer at Fitbit, for example, and he said it takes him about three months, or it takes his engineering team about three months to add haptics to a product. When they, when they work on a new product, it takes that long. And one of our KPIs is basically saying we want to reduce that time to one week. We want to offer developer tools that you can literally like, you know, put into your product, drive with an audio signal, and that's your haptic experience. And so instead of programming haptic APIs and stuff like that, all you do is sound design. You just input you know, the sound of a footstep or the sound of a button click, and our DSP will take care of the rest and turn it into something that actually feels like a button click. So here we basically have uh, different, we call it EVKs, evaluation kits. They run on, on embedded processors. In our case, we use an, an STM and a CSR chip. And also what's really important for the industry is we have you know, really heavy documentation on, on our APIs, on our um, uh, hardware spec and, and placement and things like that. So um, how many of you are haptic, uh, it's not haptic, how many of you are um, UX designers here? Hands up. Uh, what is everyone else doing? How many of you are developers? <laughs> okay, what is everyone else doing? <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, uh, let me just forward. So I want to talk a little bit about the challenges um, in designing haptic user experiences. There are, I think, three or four key learnings that, that, um, um, that I made throughout that, that phase at Lowfield. Um, one is when you create something like wideband haptics, it is, at the end of the day, it's a sensory experience. And it's probably the same between you and me. You know, I'm talking about wideband haptics and footsteps and stuff. You will probably not really be able to imagine how it's really feeling until you try it. And that is a real key challenge when we communicate it to the industry. You know, we send out pitch decks like, hey, this is all the great stuff we're doing. Until you actually have a face-to-face -face meeting and show it to people and let them experience it, it's very, very hard to communicate. I think this is relevant if you're a UX designer and you try to pitch this to your project or product, um, product manager, keep this in mind. You have to have something that people can try out, otherwise it's going to be close to impossible to convince them to put it into their product. Second one is haptics is a multimodal experience. And this is probably one of the most important things to remember. Haptics alone just does not work. If you wear a bracelet, even though it's a great product, it does not work on its own. You have to have headphones to listen to music. Otherwise, it's just something buzzing on your arm. But once you put the headphones on, your brain will basically combine the two sensations. So again, haptics needs either visuals or sound to work. Even if you are on a phone or, let's say, on a, on a MacBook, you know, the trackpad, the latest trackpads are all haptic feedback. Um, you actually have also a click sound. I don't know if you ever you know, paid attention to that, but if you, if you click the trackpad, there's a slight sort of click sound to it. And that actually is the part that makes it real. And we did a lot of tests where we actually eliminated the, the, the acoustic part of the click, and it's not as strong anymore. Haptics alone is just not, uh, you know, not a very powerful um, uh, sensation. The fourth one is we have a lack of standard in haptics. So basically, audio technology has a lot of standards. You know, for a good speaker, you know what, what, um, uh, what the SPL should be. You know what, what the signal-to-noise ratio should be in, in a good audio system. In haptics, that just does not exist. And the challenge here is you can't just copy the audio spec over because your skin has a completely different resolution, completely different frequency range. So we are now actually looking at um, you know, what could actually be a meaningful spec for, for wideband haptics, what frequency is really relevant. Um, Again, I think the, the, the industry needs to move away from just like single frequency on off, you know, 3G, whatever, um, uh, uh, force actuators into thinking much more of it as an experience and thinking about what, you know, what spec do you actually need to achieve, uh, need to uh, match to, to uh, get that experience. The last um, piece of information is um, haptics is still an afterthought in product planning. And uh, again, if you work on big projects, like we, we are we're working with some of the 
top brands in, in, in the US and even there the, the UX designers complain about when a new product is spec'd out, they basically put haptics, like just copy haptics over from the last project. It's like, oh, just one week, put in a new motor and done. Um, and then when the UX uh, people are saying, well, you know, we actually want something better, you know, we want to actually curate a new technology and implement it, it's too late. The project is already set up and so haptics, I think, and but this is something that we're already seeing uh, changing now. So in the future, I think haptics will really move from this afterthought to something that's a lot more ubiquitous and that you know sooner or later will become standard like a retina display or, or high quality sound. So with that in mind, basically what we do, um, a big part of our work is actually prototyping. So this is a, a colleague of mine, Andrew, who's um, hacking a Nintendo Switch. And there's actually a blog post on our website if you're interested. He kind of walks you through the, the steps of, of hacking it and what he need to, uh, needs to pay attention to and, and how he drives it. And also some, some actually some end results in terms of graphs on how it performs um, compared to the original tech that's in the Nintendo Switch. But hands-on prototyping, showing it to people basically a huge part of haptics because it can't really be communicated in, in, in text or, or visuals. So I'm coming to my last part of the presentation. Um, I, how are we doing for time? Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the learnings from a technology startup. How many here are part of a company with less than five people? <laughs> Would you consider yourself a startup? Or has it always been five people? <laughs> or let's let's put it this way: How many of you are part of a company that that um, is you know less than four years old and is raising venture capital to grow and and build products? All right, a few. Okay, cool. So um, you know, as we go through the struggle of building a company, uh, it's, at the end of the day, it's a roller coaster, right? I mean, there are great times launching a new product, fantastic feedback. And then there are down times when something doesn't work out or you just get some bad news or it's just business that is more difficult than you thought it should be. Um, and there are a couple of things that, that, you know, for me that I always remind myself that kind of keep me going through that phase. Um, one is one of the biggest motivations, I would say, in running a company or, or being part of a, a young company is that you actually get to do things that you're not qualified for. And this is actually super rewarding because if you're in a big corporation or, or a big company that has pretty much siloed or defined their, their teams and their, their, their departments, then, well, I mean, you're going to be applying for a job that's pretty well defined and you come in and you do that job and maybe after two years or so you, you, know, you get to do something else. In our case, it's actually sort of the opposite extreme. There's a lot of stuff that's completely undefined where I come in or when someone comes in, I say, well, I mean, this is what needs to come out at the end. Can you please define your job to get there? Because I don't, I don't have it, basically. Um, and you need, I mean, when you do that, you need to actually hire a certain, or a certain type of people. You know, not everyone is happy doing that. Some people actually prefer to be rather, you know, not told, but like, um, directed or, or um, led into like, you know, this is your role and this is where it ends. But if you're into exploring and, and, and checking out new stuff, then, then I think a young startup is, is a usually a pretty good place to start. The second one is, and this ties especially to hardware, everything that can go wrong will go wrong, especially when you go into mass production. And um, the interesting thing here is for us, when you go into mass production, luckily I have a, a co-founder and CTO who um, used to work for, for big corporates like Sony Mobile and Texas Instruments. So he's been through the entire um, mass production cycle with really, really big brands. We also just recently hired an, um, a Taiwanese colleague who um, comes from big um, contract manufacturing background. Um, in the end of the day, whatever you don't test for at some point will break. It's 100% it's guaranteed. So as part of the product development, you basically spend more time testing, validating, creating test spec, making sure that, you know, fatigue tests, whatever you have to test that could possibly go wrong once users have it in their hands because when it breaks after it's being sold, it's going to be really, really expensive. The third point is survival is making it to market. So many of us or many you know, companies, tech companies like us who are in that B2B space, they will quickly find uh, companies who are very interested in what they do. Um, and then suddenly you work with, you partner up on a project with a company that has 100,000 employees. And you know, you, the next day you get um, emails from 15 engineers asking you stuff and asking you for prototypes and stuff. Um, 
until that deal is signed, it basically doesn't mean anything. You have to you have to be really really careful. Like we have right now, you know, probably twenty or thirty companies that we could we could just spend all our time prototyping for companies that are interested in. Oh, could you build this into my product? Could you build that into my product? Um, in the end, of, at the end of the day, we basically burn all our money and all our time for nothing, basically, because the 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 reality is that only a tiny tiny fraction of those proof of concepts or prototypes will actually end up in mass production, and so this is something that you know you have to constantly keep in mind and drive for. What are the things that are actually going to make it to market, and only spend time on those things. And last but not least. Um, this also again relates to haptics and you know it being actually quite difficult um, to communicate to an audience. Um, a big part of the success I find is uh, the ability to tell a story and um, your speed and excellence in execution. So again, if you talk, you know, if you if you let's say if you have a meeting at uh, I don't know Google or Huawei, you probably have one shot. And you know, I mean, you go there, you have one meeting, maybe half an hour, and you have to get that absolutely to the point because there will be no second meeting because they're way too busy uh, to look at all the startups. So um, storytelling is super important. You have to be absolutely clear about what is your vision, what is the benefit for users, why should that company actually implement your technology. Um, yeah, I can only highly recommend uh, to think about that when you go out and uh, talk to bigger companies. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> One. So one, one, one quick note, as you can see, um, we're also hiring, so if anyone, I think this is probably a pretty good audience, so if anyone is interested, um, yeah, these profiles are not public yet, so um, you know, if, you're, if you match any of these categories, please, please uh, come to us after the show and, um, and grab our business card. Also, we have demos here. Haptics needs to be felt, so if you're interested, um, come by and, and check it out. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was already thinking when you talked about the demos, it's going to be an issue uh, with everyone lining up <laughs> in front of that table wanting to, to test uh, the bracelet and all the hacks you did. But yeah, um, we also have some time for Q&A. Who has questions? Um, first again, right? Or second? Um, you mentioned on one slide localization. So how can this uh, help with localization of objects or whatever, whether you've used eye trackers? To, as an as a input uh, source to be able to help with the localization. And when you talked about the increased response time in gaming, like you made that sound like a feature. How is that a feature that's increased response time? I thought you were after decreased in response time. But so I didn't know how you actually meant that. OK, I didn't get the uh, Anyway, let me, let me start from the first question. Um, which one? Sorry, the first question was? <laughs> There was two questions. The localization, thank you. Um, so there, there are basically two aspects. One is, in, let's say, in gaming today, if you have a PlayStation 4 controller, it just vibrates. It's just one thing in your hand that vibrates. There's no left, right. There's no forward, backward. Um, in our in that product that's launching soon, um, the haptics are stereo. So if you play PUBG, someone is shooting at you from the right side, you will only feel it on the right side. And that... Um, you know, the sound will also be only on the right side, but because the haptics are also only on the right side, your reaction time to actually respond to that in the right direction is actually much, much better than if the haptics, let's assume the haptics would be all around or just mono, then you wouldn't actually get that same kind of, um, you know, response in, in localization. And for the actual reaction time, I'm not quite sure what you meant by feature. I mean, it's basically... Do you guys use eye No, no, not at all. Or where to... It's basically, again, from a gaming context, you're, you're being shot at and then you have to react. If you just hear the gunshot, you have a certain amount, you have a certain reaction time. If you also feel that gunshot, then your reaction time gets shorter by 70 milliseconds. So as a gamer, you basically get um, an um, unfair advantage, I would say, <laughs> because you can actually react faster to things happening in the game than anyone else. Does that make, does that, can I answer your question? Okay. It made me think about the Nordic skiers or other skiers that use different wax products <laughs> yeah. and got this advantage. Yeah, uh, other questions from the audience? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, I actually tried the bracelet, and um, to me personally, it felt a little bit weird. Uh, 
I didn't enjoy it much, but the person who had it, I didn't buy it, right? Somebody lent it to me. He was super happy with it. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, is it something that you, this kind of technology you think for a mass public or maybe for some kind of people, <laughs> music lovers, uh, I don't know, uh, gamers in particular, or do you think sure. that it can reach everybody? Yeah, right? yeah, no, no, no. I mean, the baselet is not designed as a mass consumer product. We, we absolutely understand that, you know, not everyone is going to walk around with a subwoofer on your arm. Um, I would say there are kind of two aspects to it. Some people, and it's re there's no, we tr you know, looked at age, gender, everything, there's no clear um, uh, demographic for it, but some people are immediately hooked. They put it on and they start to dance and, you know, we had uh, people crying even. It was pretty impressive. Um, and there are other people who put it on and they're like, mm, actually, it doesn't really uh, work for me. And some people who you know, say it doesn't work for them, they might still be converted after like a few minutes. So you have to kind of put on your, your you know, the music you like. I think it has a lot to do with, um, if you're not a music lover, then it's gonna be a really tough value proposition. If you're a music lover, then you should actually listen to the music that you actually love because it's not gonna, if you don't like hip hop, it's not gonna turn you into a hip hop lover either. So there are a lot of things that you need to, you know, consider, but to answer your question, no, it's not, it's not really intended as a mass consumer product. Um, it was basically like more like a concept study for us to, to explore, you know, white band or high definition haptics in, in that space. Other questions? Um, have you had any feedback from users who've been uh, using Subpack and your product? Like how, how different was the feedback? Absolutely. I mean, I think the main difference between us and the subpack is the size and the weight. Uh, subpack obviously is something that you have to put on your chair. Uh, there's also a rucksack, but you're not really going to walk around with a rucksack unless you're really, really dedicated. There are actually, I mean, I think a lot of subpack people actually bought the baselet because it's kind of the mobile version of that. Although, I mean, the tech is a bit different, so we, we don't compare us directly with subpack um, because I think they, you know, they are transducers and I think there's also no software control in it. So the way it works is a little bit different. Um, but from a from a you know basic music experience, it's it's kind of you know going in the same direction. Questions from back here. <laughs> um, yeah, you said uh, thank you so much. Uh, you said it's um, going to be implemented to a um, gaming system, um, and I was wondering, so if you can put it into or um, use it with a service or other product, what is your um, favorite product you want to have it with? My favorite product, um, I would actually say uh, right now probably um, VR slash game console. I think there, um, maybe it's also because that's the part of um, product integration that I spent most time with so far. Uh, I mean, in smartphones, it's also great. You know, you can get a lot more rich textures and clicks and, and things that, you know, let you feel objects on the screen. But really, I think the big value for me, I'm um, also, you know, I like gaming. So um, that's, that's a, it makes a huge difference in gaming. Anyone else? No, if not. Uh, I, well, if not, then I have actually a question for you. Oh, OK. Is that, is that yeah. OK? Is that allowed? Yeah. OK. So there's one last slide. Um, I kind of held it back because I wasn't sure if, I, uh, you know, if we're going to have time for it. <laughs> but it's about decision making, which is also one of the most difficult things in a startup environment because you know, for me as a CEO, I very, very often, like 90% of the decisions I have to make are basically on completely, um, um, like, like incomplete information. So, um, you know, you don't really know the market. You're going into a fog and you have to kind of navigate the ship through that fog. And so there is actually a really interesting exercise. I don't know if, if some of you have seen that already. And it's basically a question asking, so Jack is looking at Anne, but Anne is looking at George. Jack is married, but George is not. The question is, is a married person looking at an unmarried person? You've got one minute to figure it out before the company goes bankrupt. <laughs> Whoever wins can, use, can do the demo first. <laughs> Thirty seconds. <laughs> hey, what? Yeah. Wait. Yeah. Why 
All right, have you, has everyone made up their mind? Hands up, who's for A? Three people, okay. Hands up, who's for B? Also three people, hands up, who's for C? Wow, okay, great. So 80% of you are for C, it's actually A. And the interesting thing here is you have to make a decision based on incomplete information. The story doesn't actually tell you the answer, right? But you can actually reverse engineer it through logical thinking. You can just play two scenarios. You can, you know, the only person that you don't know whether she is married or not is Anne, I believe, right? Yes. So what do you do? You've got two options. She's either married or she's not married. So you can play that entire scenario with her being married and then play the entire scenario with her not being married. And if you do that, you'll have the answer, it's A. And I think this is important for, again, if you're, if you're in that process of building things, on building companies, building products, if you go into innovation, if you go into something that's never been done before, you'll always deal with incomplete information. There's no one giving you like, hey, you know, this is like la 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 and you should decide this. It's completely random. And you have to apply these methods of thinking in scenarios, thinking of, okay, what if this, what if this, what if this? And then you can get to the, to the conclusion. All right, thank you. Thank you so much.